Well, Lord, today we pray that you would speak to all of us, myself included. Lord, give, me a, give us a heart to hear, an ear to hear, eyes to understand, Lord, as was already spoken before this point. Thank you for your great salvation and love and mercy, Lord. What a, what a calling we've been called to, Lord. And help us to see how great that is this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So if God is for us, who can be against us? You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who's in you than he's in the world. We know that. We, we know how to quote that. A lot of you guys were able to finish the verse. But man, it's something else when you experience it, isn't it? It's something else to be able to testify to that because it's been a living and breathing experience. Um, it's probably good before I really get into today's message, which will, uh, will be about what we are called and saved unto. And also, I'll be sharing some of the stories from our past trip in the message also. But I wanted to thank all of you who prayed for us. And, you know, we sometimes maybe underestimate that or just take it casually, but... For the one who was prayed for, I can tell you it makes a big difference. Um, also, for those who supported us and helped us, we're not able to do that. No, no mission work is able to be done without the support of the, you know, supporting the people to go and thank you for your generous and kind support that made that possible. Um, anybody who encouraged us, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank. Um, our little Indian prayer team for their work and support. Um, thank you to our children, some of who are here, for giving us up for two and a half months. I'd like to thank Dan and Rachel Kutcher, particularly Rachel, who did so much for me so I didn't have to be distracted there for the two and a half months. I can surely tell you I never realized as much as I did on this trip how much it takes a body to do what God's called us to do. And as Paul said to the Philippian church, know that you're all partakers of the reward of anything that was done. So thank you and God bless you all for that. It was really a, such a blessing and we're very thankful for it. Go to Luke chapter 4. Um, I was really blessed. I had a hard time because uh, internet spotty in India, but um, I know Pastor Victor a few weeks ago did a message about the them which was the unknown names of people in the book of Acts who, under the persecution, went out with the message and brought it beyond Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria. And they were just, you know, everyday They were the everyday guys and girls. And, and that was such a blessing to realize that. Um, there's a quote I'm going to leave with, uh, begin and leave you with today from Hudson Taylor, who um, was a very weak, child. He was so sick he could barely stay in school for a year, and, um, but he had a burden from the Lord to see inland China, hear the gospel, a place where darkness was where nobody ever heard of Christ. And he makes this statement, which is great because I think the Lord spoke this through messages and prayers already today. All God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on God being with them. So do you feel weak when it comes to the things of God? Do you feel like you don't know what to do, what to say, how to handle it? You're qualified. Seriously, we're qualified because it's really not us. It's our, Neville shared in Proverbs, it's not leaning on our own understanding. I can't trust myself. I can't, but I can trust God. I can trust my Savior. When I lean on me, oh, it's a mess, I'll tell you that much. And then last week, Pastor Victor shared something that really blessed me in light of thinking what I was going to share today about Jesus' battle with the devil. You know, how, you know, temptations came his way. It followed on him being baptized, being, you know, into the wilderness, which the Spirit led him into the wilderness, and how he, you know, handled the devil with the word of the Lord. Um... And this was another great lesson from this past trip is people, you know, we have to recognize that life is indeed a spiritual battle. Um, and I hope today to simplify the spiritual battle and help you understand it, um, you know, for what our lives to be called to. What are we saved unto? What are we called unto? What is the purpose of our life? And I think that knowing that 
helps us with all the decisions that we make. You know, some of you guys who are in the military, you know, you understand that you've been given uh, a mission or a purpose, and it seems like all your life decisions are governed by understanding what your mission and your purpose is, true? You know, you, you sacrifices, decisions, and stuff like that. So I, it, I think sometimes we get lost because we lose sight of what we're called unto and what our purpose is. And we think the devil is just there to make us have a miserable life. Um, I'm here to tell you the devil is more than just making your life miserable. He's about deceiving you and taking away from the very purpose that Christ saved you, filled you with the Holy Spirit, and the very purpose of your life. And I think understanding that can be powerful. God is for us, and greater is we've overcome because greater is he, Christ is in us, than he that's in the world. We know how to quote it, but boy, when we get to live it and experience those verses are not no longer memorization verses. They're living words. They're living words that we can give testimony to. So in uh, Luke 4, after Jesus was tempted, it's interesting, he went into his hometown where he was brought up, and he begins by being focused on what his ministry is, what his mission is, what his purpose is which the devil tried pretty good in the wilderness to try to tempt him to succumb to the temptation and therefore not be able to fulfill or be about what his mission was. And it's a beautiful one. And uh, let's read verse, uh, if you have the church Bible, it's on pen, page 1024. And in verse 17, he was given a book or a scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. So Jesus now is speaking to his hometown. We're not going to get into all the things that follow, but he's stating what his purpose is. And doesn't it help us in anything we do to know what our purpose is? I mean, if we're confused, if we're just, you know, living aimlessly day in and day out life, trying to cope and not drown and trying not to be bad people and, you know, you know, do moral things, we can get discouraged. It can seem dead, right? It can seem, you know, listless. But I think that's because the devil has masterfully done a great job of keeping us distracted misdirected, tempted about what we've been saved unto and why we've been given the Holy Spirit, which, you know, is a deep lesson. Um, but Jesus says that he's anointed me to first preach the gospel or the good news to the poor. So the purpose of Christ was to proclaim this good news that people who were dead in trespasses and sins, people who honestly were evil by nature, were self-seeking, self-serving, helpless to do anything about it. Um, and here's the one offer, an opportunity that's a gift of love. And um, having been in India and exposed to Hinduism and Islam has opened my eyes incredibly to what, how special and true and beautiful this message is. Hindu people live their whole life believing that they are who they are and where they are because of whatever they did in a, from calmer in a, in a former life. They don't die with any hope of seeing, you know, because sometimes I'm appealing to them. They will say, you know, your God is the, uh, you know, the white man's God, and, you know, you'll get all these crazy things that the radicals want to sow into their hearts and minds, but um, they can't tell me what village they lived in in their former life or who their family was. So they don't die with any hope of ever seeing their loved ones again. And they spend their entire existence now accepting their lot, because that's what they have to do. It's not like you're born in the ghetto and you can become a doctor or a lawyer here. It's like, you're, you, that's your deserved lot. But you're hoping to do enough good things in your life to merit a better life in the age to come. Does that sound like good news? Your whole life you're wondering if you did a good enough thing to have some life in the future that you will have absolutely no understanding about. Islam. I was thinking about, you know, our God of love and mercy we just sang about. If you 
I've been reading a lot and studying a lot, and the reality is for people who practice Islam, they don't know the love. They will say Allah is merciful, but he's not. You know, he's, he, they, don't, they live their whole existence hoping that they recite the prayers properly. And where they recite them depends on how many more times of a blessing they get in these scales that have. And they live their entire existence not knowing for any assurity whether they will have eternal life and hope that the scales are in their favor. That doesn't sound like good news to me either. That means you live your entire life under this oppression of trying to think, I have to do enough good things for God to accept me. God already demonstrated his love 2,000 odd years ago at Calvary when Christ died for sinners. When Christ died and there's nothing I can do to save myself. At the end of the day, when we stand before Jesus, we can't tell him, well, we did, you know, I was a pastor, I went to India, you know, I, I did nice things, I, I gave money. No. The only thing that we can boast in is that Jesus died for us. And that kind of amazing love and that God makes us new people. I mean, I gave my testimony over 70 times in the last two and a half months, which reminded me of where I was and where I come. You know, the guy who was uh, angry and violent, daily getting high, fornicating, that God could make me a new creation. That meant everything. Brand new person. The Holy Spirit is God giving us, making us new. Because the old part of us that we're stuck with cannot be redeemed. So we can't modify it. Christianity is not about molding your, you into a better you. Stop. Rest in the grace that God gives you and let the Holy Spirit power you now to live the life and the purpose that God has called you to live. Because many and many people here even are living under different forms of tyranny, but nonetheless they're tyranny. So what do we do with this information? We look, we look to the Lord because he's anointed me to preach this good news. To set, has sent me to proclaim lease, release to the captives, which means without the good news, men and women are in captivity to something. What, it, what are they in captivity to? Recovery of sight to the blind. Now we know Jesus opened the eyes of literally blind men, but this is much bigger than that. Much bigger than that. Um, look with me at um, two places. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 4 first. And that will be on page 1157 for you who have the church Bible. And in 2 Corinthians 4, we're going to begin in verse 3, which says, Even if our gospel is veiled... It is veiled to those who are perishing. So that's who, that's who doesn't see it. In whose case, the God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So people who don't believe in Christ have been blinded by something or someone. And if we think back to Victor's message last week about the temptations that fell, the devil had more in mind than just giving Jesus a hard time. His purpose was to take him away from his purpose and mission. And I learned that this trip in a way like I never learned it before. Um, however, verse 4, for we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus is Lord. We don't preach our church. You don't preach any of us pastors. We preach Christ Jesus is Lord, right? And in ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. Listen to the heart of Paul. He felt an indebted servitude to others because of what he was blessed to know and have received. It wasn't good for me, really too bad for you. You know what I'm saying? Must suck to be you. That wasn't Paul's heart here, was it? So at any rate, for God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, Genesis, 
is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels or jars of clay, it says in some versions, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not ourselves. We can't save people. I mean, in preaching the gospel for 70 times in the last few months, I realized my absolute, it's absolutely not going to work unless God works. But God has ordained that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That's what Russell, I believe, and Bill shared at the gospel workshop. It is the way that God has chosen to save men. Paul reminds us that because the world in its own wisdom did not know God, he chose the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. So the message, yes, and we perceive that it's going to be received foolishly, is a foolish message. But to those that are saved, it is the power of God. Amen to that? My gosh, there's so much freedom in this message. There's so much rejoicing in this message. There's so much, my gosh, I don't have to live my whole life hoping I'm good enough. I'm not. Agree with God? I mean, that's the hard part people have in, in coming to God. They have to admit that they need Him, that they're not good. They can't do a darn thing to get over their sin. They can't save themselves. And the pride of man is the, ooh, resist that. Because I have to admit, I'm weak. That ain't got it all going on. That my successes in life, like Paul, are dung for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Right? That really hurts the pride of man. Because, hey, look, I'm in. I pray, gosh, I fast seven times a week. Uh, you know, I, uh, I tithe. Oh, I more than tithe. I give 55% of everything I have. We want to boast in that. We don't do that to earn our salvation. We don't do that to boast. We do that because our hearts have been transformed, and it's the outflow of a new creation that God has done in us. Oh my gosh, what a blessing. So Jesus came to give sight to the blind. Who's blinded them? So what is the devil's main reason to keep Jesus and his followers struggling with temptations every day? Just to give you a bad day? Or does he have a greater purpose in mind? To keep you busy, distracted, following you know, the lust of your own heart so that the mission gets diminished that you're called unto. If you understand that, believe me, it radically simplifies and changes your life. Um, 2 Timothy. I'll tell you, understanding this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, really helped me understand the nature of the spiritual battle. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Tim, uh, Paul's writing to Timothy, who's a minister, but as we have heard, we're all ministers, right? If, you're, if you have called on the name of Christ and you belong to God, you're a minister. It's not just a title or a position, it's, it's, it's a state of being. So he tells us, verse 24, and boy do we, oh guys, do we need to grab a hold of the first verse we're going to read. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. Oh boy, have you ever had argument, been baited into arguments and quarrels with somebody and trying to be right and come away going, wow, that really stunk. I talked for God, but I sounded like, I didn't seem like Christ-like in the way I handled that. Anybody relate? I got to be right. I have to prove somebody else wrong is not the heart of Christ. That's not the heart. So we're not supposed to be argumentative, but kind to all, able to teach and patient when wronged. That really isn't something we can do in our own nature and strength. We need the Holy Spirit to be able to do this, right? You can't give what you don't got, right? You can come up here today and ask me for a million dollars as much as I'd like to help you. It ain't happening. <laughs> so in verse 25, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading unto the knowledge of the truth. Repentance. That means I have to turn away from something, right? I hear this good news of what God's done for me as a helpless sinner, and I have to turn away and turn unto something, right? 
I have to agree with God of what he says I am, what he says is sin and what's not. We can't appeal to the feelings of men to determine sin and right and wrong. God's the one who gets to determine that. I mean, that's kind of the beginning of the temptation with the devil and the God and trying to convince Adam that God didn't really mean what he said. He does. He means what he says. He's God. He's got that prerogative, doesn't he? As the creator. But it leading to the knowledge of the truth in verse 26, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, trap of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. And the devil uses our lusts and pressures and our selfish nature to keep us captives. And when we do that, we do his will. And that's the helpless state of mankind who, who don't know the salvation of Christ. So that person you work with who's not saved is an unwilling cap, unwitting captive who will do the devil's will. I'm not saying they're possessed. I'm just saying the devil appealed to Adam and Eve's own lusts, their own sense of selfishness, and used that to oppose God. So Jesus came to bring release to the captives. To open the eyes of the blind. And God has ordained that through his son, the gospel is the way to do that. So our mission as the body of Christ attached to our head is to follow him. Right? We want to be called followers of Christ, but that means... I can't serve him the way just the way I want to serve him. I serve him the way he wants me to serve him. And it's a loving sacrifice. That bond servitude is out of gratitude. How could I not want to give him everything that I have? Because this life is short, man. I turned 55 while I was away. I know to some of you that I'm old, and some of you, you're like, you're a young guy. But it's like, the reality is, I've wasted too many of those 55 years in, in, in prodigal sunland, pharisaical religion, and, and not bearing a whole lot of fruit for Christ. And I, I don't want to spend the rest of my days that. I'm not earning my salvation, but he deserves it. He deserves my life. I beseech you by the mercies of God, after Paul goes to Romans and tells them about this message that I'm kind of encapsulating today, that you give your bodies, your life as a living sacrifice. It's the mercy of God that drives us to want to give our lives to Christ. You couldn't beat it out of Paul. You couldn't shipwreck it out of Paul. You couldn't abandon it out of Paul because he found the treasure. Oh, he found the treasure. We're not going to go there, but when Peter went to Cornelius' house, the first um, non-Jewish believers, um, he told them that Jesus was anointed with the Holy, Ghost and Holy Spirit and power to heal all who were oppressed of the devil. Now, if you go back to Luke 4.18... Jesus fulfilled that and continues to fulfill that through his people, his body. That's what he does. And guess what the treasure is? We get to know Christ. Not know about him. I mean, I can test, you know what? I tell people, and don't misunderstand me, I'm glad I have a Bible, but you take my Bible away. I don't need the Bible to tell you that Jesus is alive. I've experienced it. He's changed my life. Twice in my life, I had these major moments where I was a, I mean, probably more than that, but twice in, in a big way, I was a major league schmuck, and he still came and got me. Oh, my gosh. And I'll be honest with you, that's the only reason I ever went to India. I don't like India. Trust me, it's not the place you want to go on vacation. <laughs> but here's the thing, people, and here's where it's, the rubber meets the road. Not everybody's going to go to India or some foreign country, but we all have to be willing to go to make where you go, I go, where you stay, I'll stay, where you lead, I follow, not a lying song, but the reality. Lord, whatever, I'm yours. All I am and all that I have belongs to you because I've been bought with a price. I'm not my own. You have to be willing. I mean, one guy was so radically, you know, who got delivered from all the demonic possession was like, I want to follow you. Jesus says, no, 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 you stay home. You stay where you are and tell everybody around there the good, great things the Lord has done for you. So it's not like, you know, it, one thing's not better than the other. They're all a calling of the Lord. But we have to be willing to stay or go. Whatever. So 
let's look now to encapsulate this. I want to give you some testimonies from the trip of what the Lord does when we're crazy enough to preach this foolish message to people and, and what happens. So the right side? Yeah. This is, we were invited in this one case. Now, you know, you read through the book of Acts, but this house, this room we're in is probably 10 by 10 where you got these people and we're invited to this place and every possible place and out the door people I couldn't see sat down to hear this message that we're talking about. And these were the people in there, old women, young girls, who came and got to hear the message of salvation. And got to, some, a lot of them were actually Christians, so they got to be encouraged. But they were blessed to have us gather in this tiny little home, you know, just to be there to hear the word of the Lord. And we're gonna read statistically, comparatively, where it is in India compared here later on, and Honestly, some of this is now preparatory for what you know, the others are going to do afterwards. This is so common in India and Pakistan. This is a brick labor area. If you look out in the back, you can see the bricks. It's dirty, dusty, and they're constantly being heated by fire made with coconut shells and other wood, so it's smoky. So if you don't let, you know, I mean, just picture an inescapable campfire setting and you're going to get the right, and it's not a nice smell either. And this is where we are right here. We're standing in front of where all, it's like this long row of concrete block houses and the people who work there live there. Often forwarded amount of money that they have to try to work off but never can. So it's this form of slavery. Remember, the good news is Jesus came to heal those who were oppressed, right? And I think when I look at this next picture, I'm reminded of what oppression looks like. Because you can see in their faces. And Jesus died for them. And God loves them. Now, you don't have to go to India to see oppressed faces. You understand what I'm saying? But they willingly... but. One difference I can tell you is they will willingly gather more so there than here to hear the message of salvation. So we have to pray, people, here for, for a spirit of brokenness, for people to have a heart to want to hear and understand their need for the gospel. But they're all gathered, and that's right where they live in this, you know, it's probably, I don't know, what's it look like, about four or five feet wide? And we got to uh, encourage them and ministered to them that day. Let's see. Okay, this is just because. <laughs> Turn it up. I mean, these are kids who actually came out of brick labor. All right, let's go back a minute. Volume? Go back a minute. I just put there, this here because after seeing this, it's like it's nice to see actually you know, what's happening with kids who are actually called out of this. These are the kids at the home. The two littlest girls there. I wish you could hear them. All right, we'll try it again. Okay, here we go. Oh. It, it, it's just, that's the orphanage. Those are the two youngest girls at the orphanage. And it just gives you a reminder of what the love of God can change. You looked at the faces of those two young boys who are living there. Those girls' families are in that, and a lot of the kids in the home come out of those brick labor areas. But you can see the difference in the faces. You know, these kids are like, my gosh, I can't get enough of them. They're filled with joy, and, and but they were those long faces before. And that's what Christ has called us to do, is to bring release to the captives. You know, that's a, all the, let me summarize this. All the temptations you face are to keep you off your mission. Every one. My wife and I, I asked her permission to share this, at one point in this trip, I felt like every conversation we were having was turning into an argument. 
I don't want you to give the wrong impression. We had a great trip. But there was this point where that happened, then something else was happening, which was you know, bothering her. And I finally realized, this is spiritual. This isn't just her and I having a difference of opinion on something. So we stopped, we prayed, called on the name of the Lord to put down the one, the God of this world and his influences that were going on. Because it was, its purpose was, which was easily ready for me to see because I'm in this short-term mission trip, to take us away from why we were there and from our purpose. Here's the reality, people. Life is short. Every one of you are on a short-term mission trip, wherever you are. Every single one of us who's called by the name of the Lord, who's been born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, who's heard this gospel, is on a short-term mission trip. I am stupid enough to forget that when I come home and everything gets comfortable again, but it's still the truth. All right. Okay, we, we've seen these guys. This day was incredible. Tribal areas in India are gorgeous. They're cleaner. They don't smell. They're quieter. But they're spiritually dark areas. Most tribal people you see don't smile. Alcoholism is rampant, witchcraft, demonic, you know, all worshiping stones, gods, whatever they can worship except God. But there was a pastor we met in the middle of nowhere we drove, and there are these two lakes where they have fishing villages. And these people were not. They were smiling, they were filled with the light of the gospel that had transformed their lives. And this is Sunday service, well, so to speak. That's their church. And it just blew my mind. Does anybody know who Ganesh is, besides people who I talk to about this? It's one of the gods of India. But it's mind-blowing how Jesus said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the earth. They're here in this crazy remote area, there are people who know our God. There are people who know the name of the Lord Jesus. You guys don't know who the heck Ganesh is. You know why? Because it's just a God made with men's hands. And who's behind that? The God of this world. So here in this small little thatch church, people are praising God and we got to be with them. It just was an amazing thing to see. Then, because they're fisher people, and because they have the faith that you read about in the book of Acts, that you see them interact with Paul and Peter. They're not filled with pride, by the way, when it comes to this. They're very poor of spirit. They willingly want you to pray for them. So we're leaving, and this is Heidi being asked to pray for their baskets, because they catch like crawfish or prawns, they call them, that God would bless their catch. So we couldn't get out of the village without stopping and praying for their, for their baskets and catch. And you can see, you know, it certainly was, you know, you can see that heart. I had to take time to tell people there that God is not the God of the Americas, the Europeans, the Western God. But God is also not just the God who does these things in India. God wants to do these things here. And he's calling you and I to follow him and to do it. And that's our purpose. It's not just to try to be about my business every day. and try. If we can't squeeze serving Jesus into an overloaded life. I'm not telling you you've got to quit your job. What I am saying is we're called to something wonderful. And the treasure is knowing the Lord. Not just hearing about him. Not just trying to live a moral life and go to church. But to be witnesses of a resurrected Savior and to know him so that you know you don't suffer with things that you used to suffer with because you got the treasure what's next here oh, okay we got to this is crazy it's only a minute long and, I'm put, and this is why I'm sharing some of this stuff today. We went through, before Christmas, because Christmas is a big evangelistic event for churches there. We got to parade through this village. They got speakers on top of that vehicle. They're singing. We're with a group of people from church nearby. And these are all like Hindu people. I mean, just picture going into Apanag and the neighborhoods around here and parading around the area. 
And at three different points, they put a microphone in my hand and said, preach. What do I say? It's not what I knew. It's the one I knew who said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. I will live, be with you until the end of the age that I had to trust. So if you don't know what you're going to say, that's okay. You just need to know that the one who promises to give you the words to say will show up. But it's just crazy. You know, you got, we're in the street, this guy's trying to get by with his motorcycle. We're going by idols, temples, proclaiming the one true God. You see, Goliath taunted the armies of the living God. He taunted them. Come on. And he's taunting the church of Jesus Christ around the world. Whether it's the threat of Islam in the Middle East, or the threat of Hinduism in India, or the threat of secularism here, or it's not loving. Somehow the devil has masterfully convinced the church that the gospel is not loving. That you, I, gotta, I gotta be a nice guy for 50 years and then maybe tell them about Jesus. But it's the most loving message they ever could hear. It's the most loving thing that people could ever hear. It changes. Come on. You got your testimonies, don't you? It changed your life. He, cha he not it. He changed your life. We serve the living God. We serve a resurrected Savior. Oh, my gosh. But no, we, we lose sight of that. And we get so overworked with cares and burdens. And then everything's, we don't recognize the spiritual battle. Then everything's personal. And that's what my wife and I had to recognize at that moment. This is not personal now. Right. Tempted to think it's personal. Holding on to bitternesses and unforgivenesses. You know why you forgive? Not because that person deserves it. Because you were forgiven when you didn't deserve it. You forgive because God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That is why you forgive. Not just because you, you know, the other person deserves it. They don't. That's the idea of forgiveness. You were wronged. You were wronged. Somebody did something, they hurt you. That's why you forgive. Because God, for Christ's sake, forgave you for so much. And still does. I'm still amazed. I hate, you know what? Jesus said at one point, if you don't hate your own life also, you can't be my disciple. This is a part of me I can't stand. I mean, I can be on fire for God, and then 10 minutes later, I'm like, why the heck am I thinking these things? I still need a savior. He's not just the savior in the beginning. He's the ongoing savior. Oh, my gosh. What's next? Oh, okay. This, perhaps for me, was the biggest day yet. Went to a tribal area, a lot of oppression. Um, first time there. Shared about God being holy, you know, because you got a lot of gods there, and, you know, sometimes they take like we do, they take their culture into the churches sometimes. So I wanted to talk about what's the distinctive for being a Christian as opposed to being, you know, worshiping other gods. Being born in a Christian home doesn't make you Christian. Growing up in church doesn't make one Christian. Being transformed by the power of the gospel is what makes somebody a Christian. That's what makes us Christian. So I spoke about the holiness of God, the need to be regenerated and filled with the Holy Spirit, and then I gave my testimony. And then we sat down for lunch, and we were there with the other team from Ohio, and Pastor Solomon said, this young man wants to get baptized today. And I was hesitant. I was like, I don't, I don't, you know, you know, I don't want to be the white guy who's doing the baptism. But when I asked him why, and he emotionally looked at me and goes, I want what you talked about today. And I could see it in his eyes, I would say, and... Honestly, guys, this is not the cleanest water on the planet. So you, but it didn't matter. I, at that point, I felt it would be an honor to baptize this young man. That's the power of the message. I didn't invite him to say a prayer. I didn't invite him to do anything. I proclaimed the message and watched the Holy Spirit do what God has said he will do. And he was just... Oh, man, I, I'm, I'm moved by it because I'm reliving it. But it was one of the most powerful things I've ever seen 
go on in a man, man's heart, my wife. Because of that foolish message. Because, like, you know, because of having to recognize, no, you're not a good person. That's one of the biggest things we've got to overcome here. You're not a good person. Everybody, oh, I'm good. You know, I do this. No, no, no. None are good. No, not one. I know that may be offensive, but that's the truth. God, if, if good people can be saved, Jesus died for no reason. Died for no reason. And they'll spend their entire life thinking they're okay because they do good things. And they're living like, like, you know, the rest of the world. Okay, this is the other day. We have been to this village many times over the years. The Hindu people, for some reason, welcome us so wonderfully. I mean, they, they, they love us. They, I mean, honestly, we, could, we have to eventually say we got to leave because one after another, they will drag you into their house. One have to pray for them, to feed you, and all these other things. And then the thought came to me, and Pastor Solomon said something. You know, he says, when you go somewhere and you give your peace and your peace is returning to you, and it hit us, let's go back. And some of you know about this who follow the, the secret page. And we're going to go to different locations to try to, because we can't possibly take care of all of them the way they want to. We're going to share the gospel, and we're going to give them Bibles as a gift, which I had to deliberately say we're not compelling you to do it because that's a big buzzword in there that you don't force or compel anybody to do anything. But we want to thank you for loving us. We want to thank you for welcoming us. And we have a gift for you, you know, after sharing, you know, the wrath of God, you know, on sinners and, and that, you know, God is just when he punishes sin and then sharing the good news. But the face says it all, doesn't it? She doesn't seem to be too offended by the message and very thankful to get her Bible. And just this man's face was incredible. He just, he just almost stood there like he couldn't believe he had his own Bible. I have more Bibles in my house than I can count. And quite frankly, if we're honest, we're tempted to ignore them. Because after all, we're busy. Not knowing that in that book, God can speak to us. It's not just a reading plan, folks. It's, it's your father speaking to you personally and directly about things that are going on in your life and teaching you and instructing you to not lean on your own understanding, but to acknowledge him. You know, and this woman, again, very moved and very blessed to get her own Bible. We gave out 90-something Bibles that day. Actually, when we were leaving, some woman called from on top of a house and wanted a Bible. She didn't go to anything, and, and each place we went, we got to share this message. One, oh, this video shows you how church is in India. I wanted to show you this, just some of you have seen it. But the speakers in the churches are on the outside of the building. They're not inside, they're outside. So everybody, I'm going to zoom in on in a minute. But if you see in that trees, there's these big speakers. So that people get to hear the message. Earlier in this trip, that happened during Christmas when I went to speak somewhere at night. A man who had a broken leg, who was not saved, couldn't come. And as we were leaving the next day, Pastor Solomon got a message from the pastor. The man wanted us to come by. And he, I've never seen anybody so passionately say to me, I wish I could speak English, I want to talk to you. And I turned to the pastor, I said, to that church, I said, I'd be having coffee with this guy this week and next week and the week after. Because God did something in his heart through the power of the message. Now look, these are the highlights. I can tell you about the hundreds of prayers that don't get seemingly get answered and the hundreds of people who seemingly don't hear. But that's not the point. If you don't share, then the ones who will respond won't, res won't have the opportunity to respond. All right, can we turn this way up? No, there's a reason for this. This is on top of the home. And I'm out in the morning. And you hear the chanting for the Hindu God coming over the valley.
repeating the same words over. I don't know what they are, but I can tell they're repeating. So, if they don't hear, how will they get saved? If they don't get a chance to hear, they're living under the oppression of the devil, believing that they have to merit their own salvation. That's what they're hearing. This is pretty much where, you know, at this point I'm going to play a video for you for what's coming up next now. Why, you know, often sometimes we hear, you know, well, why do you go, why do we go somewhere when there's need here? You know, should we do, it's both. As God's people, it should burden us that there are uh, countless numbers of people on this earth that have never heard the message that you and I have had the opportunity to hear more times than we can count, right? Now, I'm playing this video for you because statistically, even knowing some of this stuff, I was like, wow. So, no, no not everybody goes, but maybe you should. Everybody can certainly pray, right? And certain, everybody can certainly help those who are called and willing to go. Simple enough, right? I can testify to you the beauty of the power of the body of Christ in action from this last trip. It makes it happen. Without you guys praying, without the people who helped, without the people who supported, those four or five different testimonies would not have happened. Right? Our purpose is to be, our mission statement is go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptize them and teach them to observe all I commanded you. That was the parting mission. You will receive power, it's not yours, it's his, that works through you, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Warwick, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So, all right, I don't know if we want to blast this, but what happened? I found this revealing. Understanding the remaining mission task. Who has already heard the good news about Jesus? And who is still waiting to hear it for the first time? Nearly 10% of the world's population are committed followers of Jesus, who believe Jesus is who he said he is, and who have given their lives to him. They believe anyone can know God through Jesus, and they tell people around them about him. Many other people also identify as Christians. These other Christians need deeper faith in Jesus and a personal relationship with God through him. About 33% of the world's population identify themselves as Christians. But where do the world's Christians live? The good news of Jesus is spreading in the world, but not evenly. First, let's divide the world into regions by population, then show where the Christians live. Two countries, India and China, each have one-fifth of the world's population, so they will get their own section. The Muslim-majority countries also get their own section because they are similar to each other. There are other Asian countries and other non-Muslim-majority countries in Africa. Here is Europe's population, and North America lumped with all the Pacific Island countries, including Australia and New Zealand. And finally, Latin America from Mexico South. In each region, let's show the followers of Jesus and the others who identify themselves as Christians. Latin America has the highest total percentage of Christians, followed by North America and the Pacific. Europe has many nominal Christians while non-Muslim Africa has many committed followers of Jesus. Today, China has also many committed followers of Jesus. Other Asian countries average about one-third Christian, including Korea and the Philippines. Some Muslim-majority countries have had Christian people groups for centuries. Of all the large areas of the world, India has the lowest percentage of Christians. As you can see, the Christians are not evenly spread around the world. Today, most Christians live in the Americas, Europe, or Sub-Saharan Africa. In each region, the committed followers of Jesus can renew the faith of the other Christians and can tell the non-believers in their own people groups about Jesus. Let's call these people culturally near non-believers and show them as green. 
These non-believers are their relatives, neighbors, and co-workers who speak, eat, and dress like them. In China, hundreds of millions of non-believers are now culturally near to followers of Jesus. 40% of the world's non-believers have many Christians in their own people groups who can reach out to them without learning a new language or culture. So their groups are called reached people groups because the good news is spreading there. Believers in China have a challenging job to share the gospel with so many non-believing relatives and neighbors, yet thankfully they can do it in their own language. In the reached people groups, committed followers of Jesus can encourage the other Christians in their families and communities to become fully committed to Jesus. They can also tell the many culturally near non-believers in their own people group about Jesus without learning a new language and culture. Many people in the world live in other ethnic groups, which have almost no followers of Jesus who belong in their communities and know their language. They have no chance of learning about new life in Jesus from someone within their own people groups. 60% of all non-believers in the world have few followers of Jesus in their own people group. They are culturally distant from believers. Let's show these culturally distant non-believers in blue. Most of them live in India, Muslim-majority countries in Africa and Asia, or other parts of Asia. They need believers from other people groups to come learn their language and culture and tell them about Jesus. They live in unreached people groups. Distinct ethno-linguistic people groups made up of less than 2% followers of Jesus and less than 5% other Christians. Which unreached people groups are the frontier peoples? Some culturally distant non-believers have so few believers that they have no chance of hearing about Jesus from people they know. Let's use a darker color of blue to show those with less than 0.1% Christian in their own people group. About one-fourth of the world's population live in frontier people groups, and over 95% of them are in India and Muslim-majority countries. These frontier people groups have no movement to Christ and no breakthrough of indigenous faith. Now is the time to unite what we know with what we do. So we know that the reached people groups have lots of followers of Jesus who can tell them about Jesus. But guess what? We send 30 times as many cross-cultural Christian workers to them as we do to the people in unreached people groups. 30 to one. These workers are not just going out from the West. They're going from everywhere to everywhere. But most of them are sent to work with other churches in their training or outreach programs. Currently, for every 30 cross-cultural Christian workers that go to the reached people groups of the world, roughly one goes to the unreached people groups, including the frontier people groups. As a result, the needs of people in unreached people groups, especially those in frontier people groups, are being grossly overlooked. The remaining mission task is largely in India, Muslim majority countries, and Asia. We need many more witnesses for culturally distant non-believers in unreached people groups and in frontier people groups. The frontier peoples are still waiting to hear about Jesus for the first time. This is the mission mobilization challenge of our generation. Jesus said, you say there are four months and then the harvest, but I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white already. And um, I don't know what God wants to do with us as individuals, but I will tell you to pray because we should have a burden to at least pray for those that are working in these areas. And as Jesus encouraged his disciples, pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers there. Because some people have never had the opportunity or the privilege um, to hear what we hear, hear what we have heard. Never. And there's only one way to salvation. I know that sounds tough, but it's true. They need to know about Christ or they're going to just... And, and the reality is, as I've studied missional stuff, those people in these areas, they're not nice people. <laughs> 
It's not like they're good people who are going to deserve a break. You know what I'm saying? A lot of them aren't because they need to know the love of God. Isn't it the love of God that transforms our hearts? Isn't it knowing that the one who created you loves you, didn't create you for the purpose of destroying you, but wants to make, his, make you his own children? I mean, that, I'm telling you, there's only one reality where people are children of the creator. Therefore, Christianity is not a religion. It's the way. God created us for a purpose. The devil wants to do everything in his power. Your fight with your spouse, your fight with your co-workers, is to get you all worked up and embroiled about that so that you're, all your energies go into that and you're not caring about God or Christ and things around you. And that's our nature. We all got to acknowledge that that's where gravity is going to pull us if we don't become deliberate and intentional to pray, Lord, lead me not into temptation. Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I, you know, I need you. Oh, how I need you every hour I need you is certainly true. Now remember, all God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on God being with them. So we're going to finish at this point with the message. Um, you're all invited 30 minutes or so from now to come back. My wife, Tim, Bethany is going to share some stuff. I'll just share a few. I've done most of my talking. But, um, you know, just a few closing comments. And thank you again for all who have prayed, encouraged, and supported. And remember, the things that I showed you, God wants to do here. He's just saying, you know, we, maybe we just need... To say, Lord, show me your glory. Lord, show me you. Because everybody who got to see a vision of the Lord was undone. And then they were able to hear the voice of the Lord. Who will go for us? And whom shall I send? And we can say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Amen. Whether that's your workplace, Warwick, somewhere else in the country, somewhere else in the world. That's the Lord's prerogative because he directs us. Amen. So, Lord, we thank you this day for the great message of salvation, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for those that are working in these places, Lord, to reach those who have never heard, Lord. I pray today that you would encourage them and that you would strengthen them, Lord. And, Lord, give us eyes to see what's right in front of us, Lord, to put aside the distractions, to not give place to the devil, Lord, to not give him opportunities, Lord, but, to, but with love and passion and fire and excitement, Lord, that we get to know you and join you in what you are doing on the earth, Lord. For this age is short. Oh, God, it's short. As Moses said in Psalm 90, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom, O oh Lord. Because eternity, Lord, is going to be beautiful. No more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying, Lord, no more sickness, no more death. There is none like you, Lord. There is none like you. Give us the boldness, Lord. To not listen to the threats, Lord, but to hear your voice and to, to know the treasure that you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.